So this is part two of the series I'm doing on it's the insulin resistance stupid. And just to remind you that if you want to get the text behind these talks, you'll be able to find them either on the Noakes Foundation website or on the crossfit.com website. And there I've given you more information plus lots of references to explain exactly what's behind my thinking. And I, I'm, what I'm trying to show you is how the science was distorted, that the original studies which really showed us that there was this condition of insulin resistance were hidden and instead of demonizing carbohydrate as the cause of heart disease because that's the way the evidence was leading in the late 1950s early 60s along comes Ansel Keys and without any decent evidence we go the completely the opposite direction and we say no carbohydrates are healthy and that fats are dangerous to our health. And so we convert the entire world to eat more carbohydrates, which would have been fine if the majority of the world's population are not insulin resistant, but they are insulin resistant. And when you take a population that's insulin resistant and feed them high carbohydrate diets, the consequences are dire, as we've described in previous talks. So in this talk, I'm going to show you how Gerald Raven becomes interested in carbohydrates and carbohydrate-induced hypertriglyceridemia and how he's on the verge of showing that the metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance as he described it is caused by high carbohydrate diets. He was on the verge of proving that a low carbohydrate diet could reverse the condition but he stalled and stopped and I'll try to explain why he did that and why he would not study carbohydrate intakes below 40%. And as a consequence, he never cured the condition that he described. And my opinion is he would have won the Nobel Prize if he'd just done one more experiment. He was one experiment short. And that experiment was the studies that are now being done by the low carbohydrate movement where we're studying carbohydrate contents below 10 or 5 percent and there we're showing reversal of type 2 diabetes and the metabolic syndrome. But Raven was there, he was the first person to do it but he stalled and I'll explain why he did that. So here's the great man and, and even though I criticize him he was an astonishing intellect and I don't want to say it was his problem because he worked in a system that prevented him doing what he had to do. It did not give him the academic freedom to study truly low carbohydrate diets because I think if he had, he would have lost his position at Stanford University and he would have lost all his funding. So if one criticizes Raven, it's not, the criticism is not directed at him. It's directed at a system that doesn't allow academic freedom. So here's a free thinker and he eventually feels the pressure that he can't do an experiment which clearly his evidence was leading him. And I don't believe he stopped because he didn't see the future. I think he stopped because he realized that his career would end if he went, took it any further. So in the previous talk, I showed his study where he was able to show that it's insulin which drives excessive triglyceride production in the liver and that excessive triglyceride production by the liver causes high triglyceride concentrations. So I showed this slide and on the left it shows that the, there's a linear relationship between triglyceride concentration in the blood and the rate at which the liver is producing triglyceride. And on the right he showed again that the average plasma insulin concentration seems to show a linear relationship to the blood triglyceride concentration. So he concluded that insulin is driving triglyceride production and of course he also showed that it was the carbohydrates which were driving insulin and that the extent to which the insulin rose was a function of the person's insulin resistance. So some years later, in a, I think in about 1974, he went back to look at the role of insulin in hypertriglyceridemia. And in this experiment what he did was he actively measured the level of insulin resistance and he would worked out a method for doing that by infusing different drugs and glucose he, and insulin, he could work out his measure of insulin resistance. So it's a, it's a highly technical way of measuring insulin resistance, but my point is that he was measuring insulin resistance as he described it, 
And then he related that to, to the extent to which hypertriglyceridemia developed. So on the left graph, we have the, the, the degree of insulin resistance, and that measured by this SSPG. And the point is that you need to go back into the article if you want to see exactly how he did it. It's quite complex. But the point was that he did another experiment to measure insulin resistance in all these subjects. And then he tested them with carbohydrate ingestion and showed that the insulin response was linked to the level of insulin resistance and that the insulin response influenced the plasma triglyceride concentration. So he was able to show here then that depending on how insulin resistant you were, that would determine your insulin response to carbohydrate and that would then determine your triglyceride response. He'd assumed it in the previous studies, but in this one, he was able to show it. And then he was able to show, as he had in the previous studies, that the insulin drove the triglyceride production in the liver and that the triglyceride production by the liver drove the blood triglyceride concentration. So he really confirmed what he'd already shown some years earlier. But what he did now was to show the wide range. Look at that wide range of responses. And so that if you look at the insulin response, it goes from like 100 to 700. So that was the individual. And the plasma triglycerides went from about 100 also to about 800. So in that wide range of people, he could show that insulin resistance was the driver of the differences. So he concluded, we found highly significant positive correlations between insulin resistance and insulin response between the insulin response and the VLDL triglyceride production rate and between the VLDL triglyceride production rate and plasma triglyceride levels. So the advance now is he's measuring insulin resistance and showing that the more insulin resistant you are, the more insulin you secrete and the higher the triglyceride concentrations because you turn on VLDL triglyceride production in the liver. And on the basis of these results, we conclude that insulin plays an important role in the genesis of endogenous hypertriglyceridemia through its influence on VLDL triglyceride production. So at this point, you have to say, here's a man who's showing that insulin is a key driver of triglyceride production. We know that triglycerides are elevated in heart disease, so you have to link carbohydrates to heart disease through triglycerides. And therefore, the conclusion would have to be that the more insulin resistant you are, the more likely carbohydrates are going to cause problems, whereas only the people who are insulin sensitive would be able to eat carbohydrates and not show these abnormalities. In the next study, he showed that you could induce hypertriglyceridemia by a low-fat diet, so that now he's comparing a low-fat to a high-fat diet, and again showing that triglyceridemia can be produced. In this study, his low-fat diet is 30% fat and 55% carbohydrate, and the control diet is 45% fat and 40% carbohydrate, which is really interesting because that's exactly what Americans were eating in those years, in the 60s and 70s. They were eating a 45% fat diet and a 40% carbohydrate diet. So a 40% carbohydrate diet was not a low-carbohydrate diet, it was the average diet. And so you would also think that he would want to go below 40% to make it a truly low carbohydrate diet. So what he showed on this diet was that in blue is the low fat diet. And you'll see that people eating this diet for on the 42nd day, their triglycerides were elevated and the cholesterol was unchanged. But in response to a glucose tolerance test, you can notice that their, their glucose and insulin rose much higher on the low fat diet than on the control diet. So again, confirming that a low-fat diet is not healthy for these people because it causes hypertriglyceridemia plus an increase in glucose and insulin concentrations. And so in 1976, Raven writes this. Remember, 1976. Since hypertriglyceridemia is in yellow, a significant risk factor for the development of coronary heart disease. And since our data indicate that the moderate increase in dietary carbohydrate associated with a low-fat diet will elevate plasma triglyceride levels, 
We believe that more caution is necessary before we recommend the widespread use of low-fat diets for heart disease populations. So there he's identified two things. Triglycerides are a problem, and notice this is a moderate increase in dietary carbohydrate. So, so imagine if you took a large decrease in dietary carbohydrate, what results you might have. And that was, I'm trying to say, what he should have been doing. He should have studied, if a moderate increase causes such problems, what about a large decrease? Wouldn't you expect a good response? He then completed three really important studies in the late 80s, early 90s. And those are shown here. On the left, deleterious metabolic effects of high-carbohydrate sucrose-containing diets in patients with non-insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. His next study then showed that the effects of low-fat, high-carbohydrate diets are retained for months. It's not a transient thing. And then he showed the effects of varying the carbohydrate content of the diet in patients with, with type 2 diabetes. So these are three really important studies. And they end in 1994, which is really interesting because you'd think that he's clearly in a direction showing that the less carbohydrate, the better. And then in 94, he just stops, stops the research without solving the problem completely. He didn't reverse diabetes. He said it's helping these patients, but he failed to take the next step. So let's look at the first step, the deleterious metabolic effects of high carbohydrate sucrose containing diets in patients with type 2 diabetes. And in this experiment, again, he's stuck on his 40% carbohydrate diet versus a 60% carbohydrate diet. And in blue, you can see the results for the 60% carbohydrate. And you'll see the triglyceride concentrations are elevated. And VLDL triglyceride is also increased on the high carbohydrate diet, reduced on the low carbohydrate diet, predictable from all the studies we reviewed. And then this was data taken over the day in which people were eating, and they were eating either the high or the low carbohydrate diet. And you'll see that on the high carbohydrate diet, plasma glucose concentrations are consistently elevated, plasma insulin concentrations are higher, and plasma triglyceride concentrations are elevated. So again, you can see that a 40% carbohydrate is reducing those variables. But where's the 20% and where's the 10% carbohydrate? Because in my eye, I can see lower lines for a 20 and a 10% carbohydrate diets than he's shown there. But we don't have those data. And the question is, why didn't he do it? And then this is the postprandial plasma glucose insulin triglyceride responses. So he measures those data over the period of the day, which is eight hours. And you can see the glucose is lower, the insulin is lower, and the triglycerides are lower consistently. So it's significant. All of the values are significant. So the 40% carbohydrate diet significantly reduced all these values. And even urinary glucose excretion was reduced on the carbohydrate diet. And so the, that's clearly benefit to people with type 2 diabetes. So he concluded, these results document that low-fat, high-carbohydrate diets containing moderate amounts of sucrose, and here's the key, similar in composition to the recommendations of the American Diabetes Association. So here in 1987, he's showing that the dietary guidelines of the American Diabetes Association are detrimental to the health of patients with type 2 diabetes. And as he says, they have deleterious metabolic effects when consumed by patients with type 2 diabetes for 15 days. And then he warns, unless, until it can be shown that these untoward effects are evanescent, i.e. they disappear quickly, and that long-term ingestion of similar diets will result in beneficial metabolic changes, it seems prudent to avoid the use of low-fat, high-carbohydrate diets containing moderate amounts of sucrose in patients with type 2 diabetes. This is 1987. Did the American Diabetes Association take any notice whatsoever? No. Not until last year when the Verta Health study came out and the results showed that you can reverse type 2 diabetes on a high-fat diet. Only then did the ADA start to change the guidelines.
But in 1987, here is one of the leading scientists in North America saying, guys, we should be a bit more cautious. So the next study was to see, did the hypertriglyceridemia, was it only evanescent? Did it change quickly? And he was able to show that didn't happen. He showed that it, if you kept these people eating the diet for six weeks, their triglycerides remained high, their glucose remained high, their insulin remained high. So the results of this study indicate that high carbohydrate diets lead to several changes in carbohydrate and lipid metabolism in patients with type 2 diabetes. That could lead to an increased risk of coronary artery disease. And these effects persist for greater than six weeks. Given these results, it seems reasonable to suggest that the routine recommendation of low-fat, high-carbohydrate diets for patients with type 2 diabetes be reconsidered. Again, I've made the point that they weren't reconsidered. We just carried on as before, as if the study had never been done. And then the final study in this group of three were the effects of varying carbohydrate content of the diet in patients with non insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. And he measured many of the same variables, and predictably you can imagine what the results were. So here's the result of people eating either a high-carbohydrate diet or a diet in which the fat content was increased by increasing the monounsaturated fat content. Because now he was beginning to think, well, actually, we don't want to increase the fat content of the diet by increasing saturated fats, but what happened? if we include monounsaturated fats. And in this slide, the arrows show when the people ate, and you can see that the glucose levels are substantially elevated on the high-carbohydrate diet, and the same with the insulin concentration. So, and remember, this is happening every day of 42 days on this diet. The glucose is shooting, it goes up to 11.5, and those values are awful. You see the fasting glucose is, is 8.5. And look at the insulin. The fasting insulin is also very elevated. So these patients are not well managed. And they're showing hyperglycemia and hyperinsulinemia. And it's just consistent for the whole day. And here's the triglyceride responses. Again, and the triglyceride levels are also elevated. And there are the four times when the people eat. And you can see that the triglycerides are lower and they come down more quickly on the higher fat diet. And in one group, he continued uh, the people on the high carbohydrate diet at the end of the experiment after six weeks, they were placed on a high monounsaturated fat diet for the next 14 weeks. And you can see that triglycerides come shooting down and stay down for the duration that they're on the high monounsaturated fat diet. However, those values of 1.4, average about 1.4, are still far too high. And that tells you that the, the carbohydrate content of the diet is still too high. We'd like to see those triglycerides below 1. So even though the diet has helped and has reduced the triglyceride concentrations, there's still too much carbohydrate driving those triglyceride levels. But I guess uh, Raven thought, well, I brought the triglyceride down so far, probably I've done the best I can, but he didn't ask the question, can I get the triglycerides even lower? So he concluded that in patients with type 2 diabetes, high carbohydrate diets compared with high monounsaturated fat diets caused persistent deteriorations of glycemic control and accentuation of hyperinsulinemia, as well as increased plasma triglyceride and very low density lipoprotein cholesterol levels, which may not be desirable. So to understand what Draven was thinking at this time, I found that he had written two editorials. And the first editorial was in Diabetologia, and it was titled, How High the Carbohydrates? Question mark. Which is really interesting. Because why didn't he say how low the carbohydrate? Because his experiments were showing that the lower the better. So he's saying now we must fix the height rather than how low. Which seemed to me that indicated... He was scared to drop the carbohydrates too low. And in this article in 1980, it's very important this point, as it will come apparent why. In this article he wrote, there is no evidence that the restriction of dietary fat will impede the development of atherosclerosis in patients with diabetes. So what I'm going to show you is that 20 years later, he's going to say the opposite. 
and he's going to say that fat does cause heart disease in those people who don't have insulin resistance. So to justify the fact that he doesn't drop the carbohydrates too low, he begins to argue according to the lipid hypothesis and the diet heart hypothesis that if you drop the carbohydrates too low, you have to push the fat intake too high. And this is going to kill you because it's going to raise your cholesterol. And the question he never asked was, well, how many people are at risk from high cholesterol and how many people are at risk from high triglycerides and high insulin and high glucose because of insulin resistance? And, and he just fudges that. He just ignores it. And I can only think that he changes this statement in 1980 because he suddenly realizes well, if I want to prevent heart disease in people with insulin resistance, they're going to have to eat a high-fat diet, but that's not going to be acceptable for everyone because my colleagues are going to complain that I'm killing patients by making their cholesterol levels go high as a result of high-fat diets. And so you're reneged. But if you read this article and you follow all the logic that I've given you so far, he had to be pushing to how low the carbohydrates not how high the carbohydrates. And he writes then in 1980, the only way to demonstrate that high carbohydrate diets will not adversely affect diabetic control is to document the effects on plasma and or urine glucose of such diets in a careful study of a reasonable number of clinically well-defined patients. So he's calling for more evidence to show that high carbohydrate diets are safe so he writes, I don't believe that this information is available and I don't see how it is possible in its absence to advocate the routine use of high carbohydrate diets in all diabetics. But that's exactly what happens. And sadly, he contributes to it by muddying the waters, as I will show. So in 2002, his book is published, Syndrome X, The Silent Killer, The New Heart Disease Risk. And if you read this book, you'll see why a low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet could give you a heart attack. My gosh, Raven's got it right. Why eating good fat actually protects your heart, the role of insulin resistance in Syndrome X, and the six-point program that can keep you healthy. So this is the book he writes. And it's kind of at the end of his career when he stopped doing research. And it is this time you can see where he becomes so strongly influenced and so scared of a high-fat diet that a high-fat diet can be toxic. So what does he write? In the book he writes a whole five or six points about why you shouldn't be eating a low-fat diet. So that's the part of the book which I'm going to show you now. So he writes, looking at the world through cholesterol-colored glasses can prevent you from seeing other potential dangers to heart health, such as risk factors associated with syndrome X, which is his insulin resistance metabolic syndrome. You can have a healthy LDL cholesterol and still be hit with a heart attack induced by the insulin resistance syndrome. This means that for tens of millions of people, Cholesterol is not the underlying problem leading to heart disease. And that's why if you have syndrome X, i.e. insulin resistance, simply lowering your total cholesterol or LDL bad cholesterol is not enough to shield you from a heart attack. Even stranger to most people is the idea that one way to guard against syndrome X is to ignore the best medical advice, to shun the low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet everyone knows is good for the heart. If you have syndrome X, and 60 to 75 million Americans do, that good diet can be deadly. If you have the syndrome, carefully dieting to lower your total cholesterol or LDL cholesterol won't solve the problem. In fact, conscientiously doing so may make a heart attack even more likely. And then, the syndrome X culprit isn't red meat or butter, it's carbohydrates. And he continues, insulin resistance is at the heart of syndrome X. That's why simply lowering total cholesterol or LDL bad cholesterol won't solve the problem. And that's why the low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet 
so highly recommended by most physicians and health organizations, is so dangerous for those with this disorder. Remember, carbohydrates become glucose and glucose must be herded into certain cells. The result requires insulin. More carbohydrate equals more glucose equals more insulin. That's the formula for disaster for those with this unknown syndrome. And that could be summarizing everything that the low carb movement stands for. There it is. And so you can see he could have been the leader of the low carb movement and he could have given us incredible support. But as I've indicated, he, he, he fell short. So he says, the more carbohydrate an insulin resistant person eats, the more insulin the pancreas must secrete to prevent the blood glucose from climbing too high. The higher the blood insulin levels, the greater the production of VLDL triglyceride and the more the blood triglyceride will rise. In other words, the more insulin resistant one was, the greater the negative impact of a carbohydrate diet. An elevated total cholesterol, which many people are concerned about, doesn't even appear on the Syndrome X risk factor list. So if you read this, this is an unbelievable explanation why high carbohydrate diets are toxic and the evidence for that. And whenever I see people being encouraged to eat more carbohydrates or a plant-based diet or to go vegan, I just see all this information and say, but haven't you read what Gerald Raven wrote? Because here he is, he's putting out exactly what the low carb movement is about, warning people that a high carbohydrate diet causes all these metabolic problems. So he, he really was the, the original person telling us that, or providing the evidence that a low fat diet is unhealthy. But he's not remembered for that because as I said, he fell short. So the question is, what was the diet that Raven promoted, his so-called Syndrome X diet? So he describes it, imagine a diet that's thoroughly enjoyable and easy to follow, lowers both elevated insulin and high LDL cholesterol levels, and can be used for either weight loss or maintenance. There is such a diet, surprisingly, it's the Syndrome X diet trademark. And there he says, the key to this diet is the ratio of protein, fat, and carbohydrate, which is 15% protein, 40% fat, and 45% carbohydrate. So having directed us along the idea that he's going to come up with a low carbohydrate diet, he comes up with a high carbohydrate diet. And the kind of fat that's consumed, mostly unsaturated. So he's allowing us to eat more fat, 40% fat, but it has to be mostly unsaturated. The two-step rationale behind this clinically tested approach is amazingly simple. Now notice he says clinically tested approach, and I'll contest that. First, insulin levels do not increase when you eat fat. True. Whether saturated or unsaturated, fat has no effect on insulin levels. Eat more or eat less fat, your insulin levels won't budge. So the logic of that is, well then why don't you increase the fat to above 40%? But so there's a lack of logic there. However, if you substitute fat for carbohydrate, your insulin levels will fall. This means that to a certain degree, more fat is good for those with Syndrome X. It means to a certain degree, more fat is good for those with Syndrome X. The trouble is that more fat might even be better. But not any fat will do. And that brings us to the second point. Unsaturated fat won't raise LDL cholesterol levels. That's not entirely true. What he's saying is that plant-based vegetable oils don't raise LDL cholesterol levels. But trans fats do. Substituting saturated fat for carbohydrate bite for bite will keep your insulin under control but will elevate your bad LDL cholesterol. Well, one can, that's contestable. Anyway, that's dangerous whether you have Syndrome X or not. And that's why this diet carefully replaces carbohydrate with unsaturated fats. These good fats keep insulin and LDL under control, which means that this approach guards against the new kind of heart disease caused by Syndrome X as well as the old kind associated with elevated LDL. You win both ways. But actually you win neither way because you fall slap in the middle. Because if you giving a patient with type 2 diabetes a 45% carbohydrate diet, the insulin levels are always going to be elevated and they're going to get all the downstream effects, negative consequences of that. So most Americans are 
already eating something very close to the syndrome X diet's proportion of protein, fat, and carbohydrate. It's simply a matter of adjusting the fat intake plus replacing some carbohydrate and most of the saturated fat with good fats. So what he's saying is you must eat more polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats and, that's, and you replace some carbohydrate with that. But then why didn't he go the whole hog and replace almost all the carbohydrate with those so-called good fats? And that, there's no logical explanation for that. Why didn't he cut the carbohydrates more? If he's so convinced that replacing carbohydrate with fat is good, and if he's so convinced that there are certain healthy fats, why didn't he go the whole hog and just say replace all of them with, with uh, those healthy fats? Now to show the problem, here are the nine syndrome X risk factors listed by Raven in his book. Impaired glucose tolerance number one. So the way you improve glucose tolerance is not feeding carbohydrates. So therefore, if you want to reverse that, you have to eat a low carbohydrate diet. High insulin levels, low carbohydrate diet. Elevated triglycerides, low carbohydrate diet. Low HDL good cholesterol, that is caused by a low fat diet. You need a low carbohydrate diet to raise HDL. So there are the first four variables he lists are all directly influenced by, improved by a low carbohydrate diet. Slow clearance of fat from the blood, exaggerated postprandial lipemia, smaller, more dense LDL bad cholesterol particles. We also know that that is a consequence of a low fat diet. Increased propensity of the blood to form clots, hyperfibrinogenemia, and that is linked to the instant glucose responses to the diet. Decreased ability to dissolve blood clots due to elevated blood plasminogen activator inhibitor, etc. Elevated blood pressure, which we know is linked directly to insulin levels and insulin resistance. So if you were to look at all those factors, you would say the way you treat this condition is an extremely low carbohydrate diet. But Raven failed to evaluate the effects of his diet on all these nine factors. And at best covering just four of these factors, factors one, two, three, and four. So he could never claim his diet had been exhaustively tested. It hadn't been. It was made up on the basis of the experiments he had done. And then he just went back and said, well, we did, we did the best we could on those diets. But he never pushed the diet to the next level to see if he could get a better response. Next, he only ever tested diets with a small range of carbohydrate contents. Critically, he failed to test a truly low carbohydrate diet of the kind developed by Stefanson, Donaldson, Pennington and Atkins in North America and by Yadkin and others in Europe and Banting in Europe. So his conclusion that the Syndrome X diet has been carefully tested and is proven to be beneficial in heart disease and more beneficial, note, than a low carbohydrate diet was never proven. He never studied it which is sad because he was, as I've said, he was on the cusp. So this slide explains why Raven snatches defeat right from the jaws of victory. He was on the cusp and he failed. So the key point is that by 1994, Raven and his group were on the brink of discovering the optimum treatment for the very condition, the insulin resistance syndrome, including type 2 diabetes, and what Raven would call syndrome X, that his remarkable research group would discover and define over the next 20 years. The treatment they would have discovered was a very low carbohydrate diet of between 5 to 10 percent. But they failed to ask the key question, if higher carbohydrate diets, 60 percent, induce an abnormal metabolic profile in those with insulin resistance, whereas lower carbohydrate diets at 40 percent have a less damaging effect, what would happen if we lowered the carbohydrate content even lower, say to below 20% or perhaps even below 10% or as low as 5%? The result that was between 1994 and when he passed away in 2018, Raven would never promote a generally low carbohydrate diet for the management of all these conditions. Instead, he would, in my opinion, drop the dietary ball on the edge of a stunning medical victory and with, with perhaps a real shot at the Nobel Prize he would snatch defeat right out of the jaws of victory. And why should he have won the Nobel Prize? Because the Nobel Prize is given to, the, to persons whose discoveries impact the most people in the world. And type 2 diabetes is now the most common medical condition. And he was on the cusp of proving the cure.
And he came from Stanford. He had all the support. He was right there. He wasn't sitting out like we are in the low-carb movement, distance from medical mainstream. He was in the medical mainstream, and he could have driven it through. By failing to ask the key question, he delayed by at least two decades the discovery that very low carbohydrate diets, 5 to 10 percent, can reverse the metabolic consequences of the insulin resistance syndrome. So we had to wait for people like Verta Health and Sami Inkinen and his crew to show that you can reverse diabetes on a low carbohydrate diet. And so in retrospect, we can now say that he missed it. He missed, he dropped the ball. He was there but he, had, he let it go and other people had to show it. So I hope you've enjoyed the, these first two talks on It's the Insulin Resistance, Stupid, because I've tried to show you how the wrong ideas came around in the 1960s because we were moving towards linking carbohydrates to heart disease through hypertriglyceridemia, hyperinsulinemia, and that people like Raven were on the cusp of showing that if you reduce the carbohydrates low enough, you can reverse the insulin resistance syndrome, you can reverse the metabolic syndrome, and you can probably cure type 2 diabetes. But unfortunately, he never took the final step. And in the future talks, I will show you how Ansel Keys and the American Heart Association, the National Heart Institute, the National Institutes of Health in the United States made the low-fat diet the primary diet, and it became government policy, even though there was no evidence to support it. And once you've made it government policy, it becomes impossible for ordinary scientists like ourselves to reverse it. And that is why we stand where we do today, why we have to have this global movement of the low-carbohydrate diets in trying to reverse the bad science that we've had for the last 60 years. The answer is we just got to keep going. And what I'm trying to do is show you keep fighting because the evidence is all on our side. And one day this evidence has to become common knowledge. And then people will understand how they were misled and why were they misled. And they will realize that they've got to start listening to the real scientists who are independent of industry and who are telling the truth. And that's why I'm so proud to be a member of this low carbohydrate movement because we are ruthless in sticking to the science. And I hope you've enjoyed this expose of what the science really shows about what you should be eating to stay healthy and to prevent type 2 diabetes. And I'm now going to add as lectures the material that I presented in those blogs. So if you want to get the full story with all the references, please go to the Noakes Foundation or to CrossFit.com where you'll see the articles written in their detail. So I'm hoping that you'll be able to get both the, the visual side of things and then to read what you want, because I think these are such an important series of articles and lectures that really give us an indication of where we went wrong in our dietary advice over the last 60 or 70 years.